moving on from that game, we've got the one of the weirder matchups this year, mostly because of the ups and downs both of these teams have faced. Um, some due to injury, some due to uh, just not realizing expectations. But that's Texas A and M and LSU. Um, LSU traveling to A&M for this one there's no way to know really where LSU's mind is after losing that that heartbreaker to Florida um, and and really having a just disjointed back half of the season but for A&M the squeaker against UTSA who's not a terrible team but 23 to 10 after losing to a misstate and an Ole Miss uh, they're definitely not trending in the right direction. So we're going to get into this game and who we think is going to win. But I want to lead off with if AM loses this game by 10 points or more, is someone still the head coach next year at Texas AM? Yes, I think he is. It, it's. I mean, even with the loss, they're still eight and four. It hasn't been a disaster of a season. Um, I think it would have to be a blowout loss for the, an embarrassment. I think if it's ten points, he's probably survives. Now, if it's thirty, he's gone. But it, I think it's going to be something. You know, if it's a ten point loss, I think he lives. How much? Lives the end of the year. Given the number of high profile jobs that they would be competing with to find a candidate, and as we previously discussed, the dearth of quality candidates, how much does that play into the fact that how much does that protect someone this year uh, versus another year where maybe there were a lot more candidates? No, I, I think it's crucial. And, and I was about to bring that up. If Texas had actually rebounded and survived, and Charlie Strong kept his job, I, I think, uh, you know, someone's still coaching. You know, Strong is we, – we record these pretty early, and we have there's a lot of editing and chopping that has to go on. But at, at the moment, Charlie Strong still has a job. I, Based off some stuff I've heard, I my understanding is that he won't have a job come probably Tuesday. Uh, but, you know, they're not going to be able to outbid Texas, and they know it. And and if if they thought they could go out and get a great guy, it'd be one thing. LSU, if they want Jimbo Fisher, they're going to get him over over A and M. And if Texas wants Herman, they're going to get him over A and M. And so now you're looking at a second or third tier candidate, and that makes it a lot less palatable to switch. And I think that that is that is a very very strong factor uh, into the decision. That you know, there's it's hard to say that anybody would have done any better this year. Um, and you give them another year, see how it turns out. And if it doesn't, then maybe there's another good candidate on the board. I'm not a big fan of that approach, by the way, because I think frequently when you have that mindset, what ends up happening is you just kind of let mediocrity continue until you've got, you know, two or three average recruiting classes and you've lost all momentum in the program. Uh, and, and then it's hard to replace him with a guy that's actually quality. I, I'm, I am, a, unlike many, many people that defend coaches, I'm actually a little trigger happy. And, and people can talk about how harsh it is for coaches all they want. You know, I've, I've heard, you know, Saban made some comment about how, how sad it is that coaches get the boot after so many years. I'm sorry. I don't have a lot of sympathy. These guys are getting, you know, someone's making $6 million a year. It, it, for, when you're being paid that much, there is a very strong understanding of the performance that is ex- expected of you. And if you don't meet that threshold, you know, you're not going to keep that position. And even still, you know, these coaches leave the next, you know, if they're in a crummy job, they'll leave in a day for a better one. Um, and if they get fired from a great job, they usually can land on their feet somewhere else. So I don't have much sympathy for coaches that struggle. I understand the stability angle from a program perspective, but when you see what seems to be, you know, it's not that you're having a tough year, you're having injuries, but you know, you've got, you know, eight with an AM's case, quarterback transfers everywhere. Um, you have a team that doesn't seem to play with uh, physicality week in, week out basis. You have a lot of inconsistency in the recruiting trail and, and you're watching the recruiting, which was very good starting to really kind of peter off. Frankly, uh, it's not there yet, but you're heading, seeing it head that way. I, I probably would let him go, but I don't think they will. 
And you know, it's interesting you bring up the point about the, the sympathy or lack thereof for, for head coaches. And I think you're right. I kind of lean the same way you do because I feel like we look at, we romanticize the position of head coach in college football and, and think that, okay, he's, he's kind of a, kind of a father figure and he's, he, we got to give him time and it's a family sort of thing. But taking the money aside for what you're paying a coach, it still is a business. And with the visibility of recruiting that's changed over the last decade, it has absolutely changed the dynamics of how we hang on to a coach and the decisions that are made on something that you touched on. If you make the wrong decision on a coach, then one year of recruiting can set you back five years as a program. And so if you make the wrong decision on a coach and they're either lame, lame duck or they languish the next year and you lose recruits because of it, that absolutely can decimate a program. And then we're talking about tens of millions of dollars that a program loses. So I'm with you. You pay a guy that much so you can fire him when you want to. So you don't have the, any of the, the feelings of, owing someone anything it's a business decision you make the call to bring them in you make the call to fire them just like anything else because you can't afford in this day and age and the, the momentum that is carried because of the visibility of recruiting you can't afford to have one two bad years and i know everybody likes to talk about frank beamer and i think he went like three and eight his first two years at virginia tech and he talks about how if he coached in the current climate he'd have never been able to give it been given a chance to have all that success at Virginia Tech. But that was a completely different era of football. Recruiting was done in quarterly printed magazines at best. So it's hard to compare eras, and I think Saban's a good example because he he is part of the new era in terms of success, but to part of the old era in terms of the fraternity of coaches and mentality there but he's also spending new era checks. So I think that's a really good point that you touched on and I had to piggyback with a rant of my own. Okay, now we're going to talk about the actual game. I promise y'all. Okay. Well, I I would imagine both fan bases appreciate discussion of coaches. (laughs) Yeah, probably because uh, they'd rather us not talk about their football teams, but (laughs) that's a different story. And I'll throw in 30 seconds more before we get to the game. But we talked a lot about the coaching situation at LSU. Uh, you know, I, I think Fisher's their guy, and, and and that's that's probably where they go. I don't maybe they keep Orgeron. I think that would be a mistake for a lot of the reasons we just said. But I, I'm going to challenge the notion real quickly that it's more difficult for a team like Alabama to go on a run today than it was in the past. I think it's the opposite because of the visibility of programs, because of television rankings. Uh, you know, being broadcast every second on the ticker on ESPN, and and you get your name. You know, Alabama, Alabama, Alabama. There's an ability to recruit nationally and you have, you know, graduate transfers all the time uh, it, and you have all this money for coaches and support staffs. Teams are able to reload and dominate. And if you can get your name to the top, you know, if you're in Alabama or you're in LSU, the power that gives you over everyone else is such that you can you didn't used to be that you could go in Nebraska and pull the top prospect out of Nebraska because he was going to go to Nebraska. But today People do that all the time. And for that reason, I think it's actually a lot easier for the the top programs like LSU, like Alabama, and like Texas A&M is trying to become, uh, to become an absolute monster uh, because just the immense national power and awareness and prestige and reach that a top-tier program has today that I don't think they've ever really had in the, in the history of the sport. So what's interesting to me about this game is there is a chance for the winner of this game to finish second in the West. Uh, Auburn's sitting at five and two right now, probably going to lose to Alabama, which would put them at five and three. If A and M wins this game, they also finish five and three, uh, which would make them nine and three on the year and maybe in line for a sugar bowl if Alabama makes the playoffs is that crazy or is that crazy I mean 
it, it is kind of amazing, but I think it's also a testament to how disappointing the end of the season is, frankly, for A&M. You know, they lost to Mississippi State. I mean, it's, if they win that game, you know, they're, they're LSU and they're in the Sugar Bowl. Like, it's done. And because they lost it, a lot of stuff came off the table. And losing, you know, back-to-back Mississippi State and Ole Miss, they would very easily be looking at a playoff spot right now if they were a one-loss team going into this LSU game. In fact, I think with the current climate, if they were if they were a one-loss team with the teams they've played, with a win over, uh, you know, a major non-conference opponent, UCLA, which counts for a lot in the crappy non-conference schedules we've seen this year, ending the game with a punctuation point over a ranked LSU team, there's a very, very good shot that they end up in the playoff. And, and that oh, it, it, it seems so disappointing is that, you know, that primacy recency thing, right? You know, the, the last thing in our mind is two really, really terrible losses in Mississippi State and Ole Miss. But the thing is, the the start of their season was so strong with wins, you know, you know, multiple touchdown wins over Auburn and Arkansas, which at the time didn't seem like such a big deal. But in retrospect, those were huge wins and, and really, really like resume setting wins. And even Tennessee, you know, it, they, they've certainly fallen off a lot, but that's still a pretty darn strong win. So they it, it, it's it's bizarre when you look at honestly at their resume, because in, in a lot of ways, they've lost to the worst teams and beaten the best ones. And that's how that's how you look at them and go, you know, how weird is it to say they, they end up in the Sugar Bowl? Well, it's weird because you, you in one hand, you think about who they lost to, but then you think about who they beat and it makes perfect sense. If they just kept that standard, I mean, it would make when they're good, they're as good as anybody in the country. A lot of it has been due to injuries, particularly on defense. It's a lot of the no name, you know, Amarni Watts kind of guys that. Uh, I say no name, but things other people aren't as familiar with that have really hurt them. But when, when they were healthy and good, I mean, there there's, especially when Knight was actually playing, you know, they're as good as anybody. And Knight, the, the injury to Trevor Knight is the reason why I, going back to the original question with you, is the reason why I think Kevin Sublin should be fired. Because what we're seeing is just how dramatically different their team can be at Texas A&M all hinging on the quarter, the perfect quarterback for someone's system, not a good quarterback, the perfect quarterback for someone's system. And if he can't find someone who can run it perfectly, or if that person gets hurt, it completely shuts down their entire season. And for that reason, and I think some of that has to do with how they aren't great on defense, but that's coaching too. For that reason, and putting a coach putting the, his entire job and career and offensive eggs in a single basket and requiring so much of his quarterback, I, I think that's why you got to let him go. You can't you can't operate a program with that little bit of margin. Yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, and it's the reason, by the way, everybody thinks we're just going off on random rants, but it's all tying back together that I talked about the the power that you have as a name brand program, a name brand program today. You know, that graduate transfer they got because they're Texas A&M saved their season in past years when that rule didn't exist. This game, this A&M team that lost to uh, Ole Miss and Mississippi State is who you would have had. You know, if they couldn't have gotten Trevor Knight without, you know, sitting out a year, that's that is Texas A and M. Uh, they were saved because of recent changes in the rules, but by extension, like you said, um, you know, recruiting. You've got. To, I mean, they recruited the quarterbacks. It's not even like you you want to sit there and go, well, you got to recruit better. I mean, they did recruit, you know, a five star quarterback. He's just not on the team. And then they they recruited another one, and he's not on the team. And then they had Kenny Hill, and he's not on the team. It. it it's it's so much worse to me than even just recruiting. It's it's a complete failure to manage personnel, develop somebody to be a competent passer, and you end up with Jake Hubenak, who, by the way, is actually you know has a I I'm going to step aside for a moment and note Hubenak actually has a higher completion percentage in yards per attempt and QB rating and touchdown to interception interception ratio than Trevor Knight, <laughs> despite not playing very good defenses. Um, and, you know, Mississippi State being the worst pass defense in the conference and then Ole Miss being a, a absolute shell of a defense at this point. 
Uh, so I don't know that it's completely fair to take away from Trevor Knight, but Knight created, as we talked about all year, this was really a run team, not a pass team. And Knight was such a dynamic runner that he created a tremendous amount of uh, power and potential for the offense. And it was a very a good enough thrower to certainly take advantage off that, but he was a constant dynamic threat. Um, but what we're seeing is, yeah, it, it's same thing we're seeing with Ole Miss. We've talked about it all year. Anytime you're this dependent on the quarterback to handle the ball every play, it's so volatile because if that one player has a good game, you're great. And if that one player has a bad game, you're terrible. And the same Ole Miss team that came from behind with Shea Patterson and beat Texas A&M fell flat on their face against Vanderbilt because in one game, Shane Patterson had a really hot fourth quarter. And in the other game, he had a bad game. And that's all it takes when you run this style of offense. And it's, it's great when you want to build a program. And I think that's why someone was successful in building it up, but it's not consistent to reach the top tier. It will get you to eight and nine wins. And we've seen that with Ole Miss and we've seen it with A&M and it can make you a really exciting team, but you get there because that volatility lets you occasionally beat somebody that's more talented than you because you have a peak, but you're also going to have valleys where you'll lose to anybody and that's not really acceptable if you want to be a 10, 11, 12 win team. Uh, and so I, I think sometimes this ceiling, these offenses kind of hit a ceiling. And I'm, I don't know, I've said for a long time, I have serious doubts about the long term viability of Texas A&M's offense if they want to be an elite player in this conference, because I don't think you can ever have a quarterback be at a high enough level consistently enough to run that offense well enough to ever, ever win the really even just win the division. So as it relates to this game, talking about that offense, um, they put up 23 on Texas San and Texas San Antonio last week, who was coming off a game where they gave up 63 to Louisiana tech. And that is where I feel like LSU wins the ball game because I don't think that I, I think Texas A&M can still beat some people. I think they have some athletes and some ability that they could even maybe win their bowl game, but the matchups in this game to me are so in favor of LSU and just so working against Texas A&M that I can't see, first of all, I don't see them running the ball very well in this game. And I don't know that they have the quarterback in this system that's going to be able to take advantage of some, what I see are some deficiencies in the LSU secondary. And on the flip side, Texas A&M's run defense has not been good this year. Um, and even in a game like Alabama where they were able to kind of shut down the the uh, running game a little bit for a while, eventually it broke. And I think in this game, if LSU stays committed to it, it's going to break the same way. Am I crazy or is this kind of making sense? I think it kind of makes sense. I don't think you're giving quite enough credit to A&M's defense. I mean, they're – their passing defense has been fairly average, but the run defense actually, it, it has been pretty good. I mean, they're, they're holding teams to right at four yards per carry, a little bit worse in Georgia, significantly better than, you know, the Mississippi States and Vanderbilt's of the conference still behind, you know, Alabama, LSU, Florida, Auburn, Georgia. Those are the four defenses holding teams to under four yards per carry. Shouldn't surprise everybody, surprise anybody, but uh, you know, they're still pretty good. And like we've talked about, you know, LSU struggled, with teams that can def defend the run, like really, really consistently struggled. And, you know, to break it out a little further, a and has also been pretty consistent defending the run. The one bad game was really Mississippi State, where they were just totally out of sorts. But other than that, they hadn't given up more than five and a half yards per carry. I mean, they held Alabama to just five. Uh, they held Ole Miss to 3.2. Arkansas, they held to three yards per carry. Um, you know, Last week is Texas San Antonio. I mean, they, they held Texas San Antonio to only 48 yards rushing on that ball game. It, it's, but you know, at the same time, it, is that enough? I mean, that's the question. And my short answer is probably no. Uh, LSU is such a good run defense. A&M for all the talk is really a run first team. I don't think they're going to have any success on the ground. I don't trust Hubenak trying to throw against, you know, a secondary at LSU that's on a completely different level than what they've been, fa what he's had to face uh, in spelling night. Um, 
And, you know, you can talk all you want about the, the team and all the effects. You know, they kind of got worn down and it bait up in the Alabama and Mississippi State games. And that's showing. I don't think they're the same defense they were. Uh, I think LSU's it, playing at a pretty high level, um, despite the Florida loss. They've, they've, I think they finally figured out that, you know, they can roll with Geis and have a lot of success. I've questioned much of the season whether Fournette was really the most effective court running back. Certainly the most talented. I don't know whether it's injury. I don't know whether it's want to. The fact that Fournette sat out the last series, both with a what is a mild playable injury, more than likely, and he did it against Auburn, and he did it against Florida. I'm sorry. I don't look very fondly on that, and I, I know he's a great kid and well-liked, and it's maybe terrible for me to say that with an injury, but you'd like to see the guy do whatever he needs to to win the game if he really wants to be this Heisman-caliber player. But, you know, they can rely on guys. And, you know, we, we talked about the uh, Mississippi State game. Both of us feel like Trevor Knight went into that game with a shoulder injury, and they realized it was it was too bad to really play. And he went out with a shoulder injury that I think either he just aggravated or they just acknowledged it was too rough. Um, they're not the same team without Knight on the field. I don't think they have enough pop to beat LSU. And, and it could, you know, Florida doesn't have much offense either, and you can take that into account, but... Florida's defense was so good that Florida barely had to score. And Florida only generated 270 yards of offense. LSU is going to score some points, and that's all it's going to take. Yeah, I will say if A&M can hold three trips inside the five for LSU to only three points and hit a 98-yarder, then, yeah, they've got a puncher's chance. <laughs> yeah, but it, you know, I don't think there's any doubt that the, uh, the beef Florida has in the front seven is on a – frankly, on a different level than a and I know that A&M has Miles Garrett, probably the best defender in college football when healthy. Unfortunately, he's not healthy and hasn't been the entire year. And even when he is, he's not a huge run defender. He, you know, he's definitely a pass rusher. I think he's he's actually underrated as a run defender. I will say that. He, he reminds me, in so many ways, he actually does remind me of Von Bell, who, as great as he is as a pass rusher, I think a lot of people don't know that he's also that darn good as a run defender. Miles Garrett, when he's healthy, is just as good. But no, I, yeah, I know. I, I gotta just stop wasting breath because I, I think it's pretty simple. You know, a, LSU, LSU should be able to run the ball, and if LSU can run the ball, they should be able to win. I mean, that's that is the synopsis of every LSU game all year, and I, I don't expect it to change this week. Okay, so close this one out for us. Give me a score on A and M LSU. Twenty four ten. That's that's probably my guess about what this will be. Okay. Uh, I think it'll be a little closer. Uh, I think it'll be another ugly one for LSU, but I'm going LSU 17-10 in this one. I, I do think LSU puts it away late, by the way. I, don't, I, don't, I think it's actually a close game, but if you're running the ball well, you, you tend to put a late score and put the exclamation point. I think that's the way this goes. All right, so that's LSU A&M. We probably spent a little more time talking about coaches than we did the actual game, but I think at this point in the season, the coaching dynamics for the team, especially at a and it, it, it's worth talking about. It's an interesting discussion point, and I think the, the A&M fans, if you look at their boards, that's what they're talking about right now as well. 